Hello, and uh, thank you for having me at this uh, conference. I, um, I'm Johan John. I'm a computational neuroscientist at Boston University. So uh, I'd like to give some perspectives that inform how computational modelers think about representation and how they might help with debates surrounding what the word means and whether the brain actually uh, engages in representation. So um, the way I frame this is, is as four broad suggestions for studying and representing what representation means. But to whom might we be doing this? Why, why are we doing this? What makes representation controversial? Uh, some neuroscientists, I'm pretty sure, are largely unaware that there are some people uh, in the psychology and philosophy world and also neuroscience that don't like the word representation and claim that the brain doesn't need to uh, represent anything and that uh, perception happens directly. Uh, I myself don't fully understand what direct perception means. It originates from the world of uh, um, Gibsonian uh, or ecological psychology. And I've looked into it a little bit. I don't quite understand what's going on, uh, but I've interacted with some people uh, and uh, this, some of these arguments are a result of arguing about whether representation is meaningful uh, for the brain slash mind. So uh, my first suggestion is to do something which uh, is fairly obvious, I think, uh, establish the colloquial literal meaning of representation outside of science and philosophy before applying it in what is essentially a metaphorical way uh, to mind slash brain and, and do this in a systematic way. Um, second, uh, it's important to examine the history of the use of the word representation, uh, see how it's evolved over time, who used it, when it was first used, uh, and I'll show a glimpse of what that might look like. Um, and then getting more close to the, the world of neuroscience, uh, we have to acknowledge uh, and understand why representation is a placeholder, particularly for experimentalists, and that we shouldn't be too surprised about that since there isn't really a consensus. So vague ideas are to be expected. But uh, not all uses of representation in, neuro in neuroscience are vague. Computational modelers, uh, especially those who are have, create models that close some kind of perception action loop uh, are using representation in a way that is more than just a placeholder. And that can give us toy models to test out our semantic intuitions about this word slash concept. So uh, to get to the basic establishing meaning part, what does the average person mean by representing? We could just work through some examples and highlight how the word represent might be used in these contexts. So in the case of these beautiful cave paintings, someone might say the painting is a representation of animals to the viewer. The statue is a representation of the Buddha to the viewer. Things get a little bit more complicated with uh, something like a record where it's a representation of music to the record player. That might be a slightly controversial way of phrasing it, but uh, a person just holding the record might, with, uh, might not realize that it has anything to do with music. Uh, and then still more uh, complicated, there's uh, language. So we can say that an utterance in sound is a representation of some scene, the cat is on the mat to some listener. And here things start to get complicated, but it's not too hard to be careful. We can also point out that the printed sentence on the slide is a representation of an utterance uh, to the reader. So it's capturing the sounds. Every time we make it clear that we're talking about something for which a, uh, a viewer or a beholder is um, important, uh, helps us clarify to what is a representation. So we have a little formula. X is a representation of Y to Z. And uh, in the context of neuroscience, it's important to recognize that X is a map of Y for Z is a particular subclass of representation that's very commonly used. And as far as I'm concerned, these are basically synonymous. Um, now, uh, once we have some examples, uh, can we go further and then define uh, in, in a more systematic way uh, what representation means so that we can deploy it metaphorically. So uh, I'm taking a leaf out of uh, machine learning here, but it has an analog in philosophy. Uh, in machine learning, you often have exemplars 
that you try to separate into classes. Uh, in this case, now I've got these examples, the, the cave painting, the record, the statue, the sentence, those are my exemplars. Uh, and I might have, uh, and so what I can do with these is create an extensional definition, all, which is just listing the examples of correct usage as well as incorrect usage of representation. We haven't really talked about incorrect uses or non-representation, but we could maybe come up with some examples. So this painting by Jackson Pollock is not a representation of anything to a specific baffled museum goer. So uh, as you go through this, you know, analyze as much, as much as you can. You could do it with machine learning nowadays, potentially, or use word to rec to see what, what uh, representation is close to. Uh, you can then work towards an intentional definition, which is a set of necessary and sufficient conditions for the use of the term. Uh, in um, Mathematically, you might have a definition that is just generalizes to all possible cases. Um, so in this diagram here, this black line uh, is a sort of useful intentional definition. It's not too fiddly compared to the green line here that we might think of as a nitpicky intentional definition that involves some amount of overfitting. But this sort of thing is being done implicitly by everybody uh, when they learn language and when they use language. But it's good to sometimes make explicit what we do uh, implicitly. So just to, as a suggestion, let's throw out an intentional definition or two uh, of representation. And you know, in the discussion, we can definitely do more of these. But, um, it seems as though all uses of representation uh, imply an object or phenomenon that's doing the representing, that is the representation. There's a separate object or phenomenon that's being represented, the target. And most importantly, perhaps, there's an interpretant, a receiver, a beholder of, of X that uh, may recognize that X is like Y or use X to do something uh, related to Y. Um, and we can also say that representations occupy a spectrum um, sort of captured by the examples I gave, but there may be some more that will illustrate that better. On the one hand, you have representations based on similarity, um, which can be recognized cross-culturally um, without learning a convention or interpretation system. And uh, on the other hand, you have arbitrary conventions, which do require learning or decoding, and you don't typically pick up on what uh, such a representation is unless you're taught. And I like uh, this uh, example because it, kind of, it contains both types of representation. So it's an Indus Valley seal. Um, you can tell the, that there's a seated man or, or woman could be uh, in the middle. There are animals surrounding him. And there are also at the top, uh, some abstract looking symbols. The fact that we could recognize that it's a man means that it's a representation that is similarity based. Whereas these more abstract symbols we, we, based on their form, we tend to think that they are symbols. They haven't been deciphered yet though. Um, so we see the similarity-based representation. The main etching in the middle is a seated person to many viewers, maybe not all. Um, and we can recognize convention-based um, uh, representation, even though we don't know what the convention is. The markings on the top represent conventional symbols. So, now that we have some idea with, with, with both extensive and intensive definitions of what a representation means outside of brain and mind science, we can deploy them and sort of use the same approach. So in the case of primary visual cortex, we have the famous log polar map. Um, and you can actually see this uh, in fMRI, uh, how this actually pans out. So we can say V1 represents the pattern of light on the retina to the neuroscientist, just to be very careful. Some people like to nitpick on this point, but the general assumption is that the V1 represents the pattern of light on the retina to the rest of the brain, which means that the rest of the brain is something capable of using what's in V1, and no one, I think, would doubt that. Uh, and we can you know, keep going with this and say the, the retina represents a pattern of light in the world to the rest of the organism. Um, a slightly different sort of representation uh, is found in the hippocampus. So CA1 place fields represent the location of the rat, again, initially to the neuroscientist. John O'Keefe had an electrode sitting inside uh, a rat's uh, hippocampus and heard uh, 
the firing. Uh, when the rat was in a particular location, there was a cell that correlated with that location. And over time, they found that different cells correlated with different locations. So the CAON place field again, presumably, represents the location of the rat to the rest of the brain. It need not be the only part of the brain that does this, but uh, given the correlational structure and also many studies, intervention studies, it seems like the rest of the brain uses this in, uh, representation that's in CA1. And, uh, the, the and this is important, and, and maybe we'll have to talk about this more after. CA1 place field replay uh, represents possible future locations of the rat to the rest of the brain. So it's not simply about picking up what's currently in the environment. Now, um, in our spectrum, we can say that V1 seems more similarity-based, and CA1 seems more uh, like a conventional or symbolic representation. Not completely, but it's more along that spectrum because there's no stable topography. What that means is that, uh, for those of you who haven't heard of place field remapping, uh, two place cells that are firing uh, in, uh, in response to adjacent positions in one space may fire, uh, may, may represent uh, spatial locations that are quite far from each other in a different place. And this is called place field remapping. It's a very well studied um, phenomenon in rodents, especially. So, um, which you didn't really know uh, what you're looking at, simply seeing some CA1 firing wouldn't necessarily give you a clue, even if it was laid out in, a topo in, uh, in the uh, topographic way of CA1. Not the case with V1, of course. So now the question is, which of these uses of representation is controversial? Who has a problem with any of this? Um, so if someone claims that V1 does not represent anything, what could they possibly mean? Um, is the pattern of, uh, of firing V1, does it not resemble the pattern of light uh, impinging on the retina? I think that's dem demonstrably false. Uh, does the rest of the brain not receive or use the signals coming from V1? Again demonstrably false. So what else might it mean to say that V1 does not represent? I don't really know. <laughs> um, but I think that the answer has to come from the history of, of this debate. And <clears throat> there's, a, there's a useful map uh, of the history of um, cognitive science. Um, I'm not going to get put through this, but I think the task uh, potentially at this workshop or somewhere else would be to really go through this and with the uh, with the help of you know text mining tools that now exist uh, to go through all the different versions of the claims about representation or lack of representation. I think we'll find that uh, somewhere in the re various reactions against behaviorism, one of which was the cognitive revolution, um, you have what what firstly uh, kind of denial that the ins insides of the animal was doing anything in the case of behaviorism, and then a swing to the opposite direction where the, the brain was uh, analogized to be a computer, which was considered the ideal model of something that processes internal states. Somewhere in here is typically where people say that the representation a debate uh, shows up, and right in the middle of this sits uh, James Gibson's approach. But I think this temporal window is insufficient, uh, and I'll give you an example in just a moment. Um, so, uh, for instance, as, uh, as I said, sometimes the cognitive revolution is associated with the idea of symbol processing, and symbol processing is, is deemed to be the main type of representation uh, that's being talked about. That may be true for some cognitive scientists, but it's definitely not true uh, of most neuroscientists. So it's a common narrative, but I think it's biased. It's an, there's too much reliance on post-World War II history, uh, I, there may be, from the perspective of neuroscience, too much focus on psychological and philosophical debates, some of which seem to depend on introspection. Um, and then I think that, so, and as, as I will show, there's a neglect of an older, looser use of representation, especially in medicine, um, and neglect of actual use by neuroscientists right now. So I did, uh, and it's not a systematic study, but I tried to look for the earliest um, uh, use of represented in the brain and versions of that phrase. And I found one all the way in 1684. This is uh, a medical textbook <clears throat> talking about some sort of ailment. And it mentions pores by which objects are represented in the brain. 
uh, for that there's no perception of any object but the pores by which the animal spirits are conveyed from the brain to the organs of sense are left free and open. What's intriguing about this is that the animal spirits are going from the brain to the pores. So already we are we're seeing some sort of top-down uh, influence coming from the brain to the, to the receptors, if you like. So clearly it's not some uh, representations are not a concept that arose during the cognitive revolution that's off by a couple of hundred years. Um, so before I get to more uses of representation within neuroscience, uh, I'd like to sort of pause and talk about information because as those of you familiar with Gibsonian psychology know, uh, information is a popular concept. They say yes to representation, but no to representation. So I would like to ask what the difference is between saying X represents Y to Z and X conveys information about Y to Z. Is there really any difference between these two? Um, and also in a sort of trivial kind of or simplistic way, we can say, how can information out there in the world influence action, for instance, via motor cortex, without being somehow made present uh, in the brain? Uh, so, uh, if we're to build bridges here, maybe if we explore what Gibsonians mean by pickup in mechanistic detail, we'll find that it was just a matter of different terminology for basically processes that are analogous. Um, so as is the case for the undeciphered Indus Valley symbol, the form of neural activity suggests information carrying even before a complete theoretical understanding has shown up. And this leads to the state of play among experimental neuroscience. Um, so here's where I come to the idea of representation as a placeholder. This is an example of a type of study that many people uh, have uh, replicated. It's a working memory task. And this is a rhesus macaque brain. Uh, there's uh, a bunch of visual cues and the animal needs to hold on to a stimulus after it disappears and then safad either to that cue or in the opposite direction. So here we see a classic working memory response where you have cells that correlate with the stimulus, but hold on to that activity after the stimulus is gone. And one would say that the firing rate of some of these prefrontal cortical neurons represent items in working memory to the rest of the brain, using our formula from earlier. And what they themselves say in this paper is that an internal representation of relevant information must be created and maintained until it can be used later to guide behavior. It sounds like an explanation, but ultimately we don't really know how any of this works. So it still is kind of a placeholder. Um, so experimentalists don't really need to have a fleshed out mechanistic scheme when they use the term representation. Um, but if you have a problem with it, what word should experimentalists use when they observe certain things? Uh, so a group of neurons or a neuron has activity that correlates with some information, which could be sensory or inferred to be necessary to perform a task. Uh, or, and this is again, something widely observed, damage to this uh, region or network hampers the use of this information. So we have, again, a formula. The neuron or network does something to the information. And we typically say it represents the information. What, are, what else might we say? I'm not saying there aren't any other words, but represent seems like a fairly acceptable one. Uh, and, and so this uh, placeholder idea is not the only way in which uh, representation is used in neuroscience. In computational models of the sort that I develop, uh, we might say representation to evoke all these meanings which we're reasonably confident exist in the general public. But if you were to you know, poke us and say, what do you really, really mean? I can, I can show you <laughs> in great detail. So here in, for instance, in this one uh, model, we were exploring uh, basically the connection between the amygdala and the thalamic reticular nucleus, but we embedded this connection in a broader circuit, including uh, corticothalamic loops involving prefrontal cortex and sensory cortices. So we were looking at how reinforcement related affective associations, punishment and reward uh, can influence uh, an emotion guided attention basically. So uh, we use the term representation. For example, um, we might say the amygdala represents salience and valence to the prefrontal cortex, thalamus, and TRN. Here it's not a placeholder because I have the differential equations that govern this entire network. So I can tell you what I mean 
by what it is that the amygdala uniquely offers to the rest of the network. And I have complete power to lesion things and break things to show you uh, what all the entire set of possible counterfactuals uh, in this particular model. So I, I can say that we are reasonably confident based on lots of data that the, a lot of the learning, the associative learning involved in pairing, say, a food reward with some stimulus, a fair amount of this association happens in amygdala. Uh, and through these projections that uh, we know exist, uh, the consequences of that associative learning can be experienced and can influence uh, attention-like processes, including off-surround inhibition. And we can get into as much detail as you like, since we uh, have full control over the model. What other terms might we use uh, for these processes? That's the question. It seems like representation is fine. So uh, just to end, uh, for those of us who regularly describe neural processes using the term representation, it's strange to imagine that memory, imagination, and language are not representations in every possible sense of the word, including some senses I didn't have time to get into. Um, and based on my experience talking to people who uh, don't like the term, they sometimes come back at you with, well, okay, maybe these higher processes, memory, imagination, and language, maybe they involve representation, but perception is direct, whatever that means. I think that the response is that given the growing consensus about top-down processes, which include memory and unconscious processing, um, unconscious inference, uh, such as in the free energy, uh, sorry, the active inference perspective, they're central to perception. And you don't really get perception without these top-down processes. So it seems uh, unlikely that we can make a really sharp distinction between perception and other uh, neural and cognitive processes. And for a couple of generations now, neuroscientists have used, and psychologists have used examples like neon color spreading, which is shown on, on the right here, to illustrate uh, situations where we can catch the top-down mechanisms red-handed. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping uh, many of you, most of you can see a sort of bluish tinge uh, inside this circle. The circle itself is not marked out. There isn't any information there to say that there is a disk there other than the blue uh, lines. So if you're, so one way to describe this is that the brain is representing the color blue. I could say to you, but if that's too uh, circular, you could say to the rest of the brain. And then somewhere in that process of representation, the experience of the color blue shows up. Um, there are still some issues largely of a semantic nature uh, when it comes to representation. Uh, so for instance, uh, it's not just about information pickup and nor is it just about working memory for things that you just saw. And this is a perfect example. What is happening when we imagine a dragon? Dragons do not exist in the outside world. No one has seen a dragon. And so therefore it can't be something in working memory. So what might someone mean if they say that a particular neural pattern creates or constitutes a mental representation of a dragon, if they choose to call it that? So we might say that neural representation is reactivated, just like in the case of the place fields, when the original cause is absent. But in this case, there's no dragon. So what is the original cause? Um, imaginary and non-existent entities can be framed as combinations of representations that do correspond to plastic experience. So the scales of a serpent, the wings of a bat, feet of a lion, face of a goat maybe. Um, should a novel combination of representations also be called a representation? From a modeling perspective, the answer is yes. And this is one of the big advantages of representations is that they don't just pick up what's in the world. They can also be used in context of reactivation and combination. And new combinations of old experiences are central to creativity, imagination, and therefore the scientific uh, method. So I will leave it at that. Thank you.